it's Ivy Slater, and you're listening to Her Success Story Podcast, a show where gutsy businesswomen share their success journey. Hi, this is Ivy Slater, and welcome to today's episode of Her Success Story. Today's guest is somebody who I was connected to through clients. So I always trust my clients' connections. They know people, they know what I do, they know about our interviews. And uh, immediately when I got this email and they're like, Jenny Dork, Dork, and you're gonna make sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Jenny is a person you should be speaking to and she should be on her success story. And I didn't question it at all. And when I got to know Jenny, it's an ideal fit Um, Jenny is the vice president of marketing at a rapidly growing sexual and reproductive telehealth service called WISP. She has a passion for women's health and digital innovation. She oversees the company's brand channels, driving profitable growth to scale and deliver upon WISP's mission to create greater access to inclusive, cost-effective care for all. Jenny, thank you for joining me here today at Her Success Story. Thank you so much, Ivy. It's so nice to be here. And thank you for the kind introduction. So tell me a little bit, let's, 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 I'm curious about your background. How did you get into this? Um, You know, did you get marketing per se, and then this type of niche focus? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, I think, you know, biggest learning from my career is you don't, um, you know, even if you try to plan it, um, you really can't. And so I've kind of always followed a philosophy is just, um, lifelong learning, constant, um, development in my skill set, um, and trying new things and really taking new risks. Um, so, you know, a brief overview of my background, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I went to undergrad in DC where I studied business and marketing and management. Um, I did not really know what I wanted to do. I didn't have, you know, um, a clear perspective on that, but I knew I had an inclination towards the business world. Um, And so I just started to get my feet wet and say yes to things. Um, Had a few quick post-grad jobs, one at a bank, um, one at an ad agency, and then felt the strong pull towards New York City. And um, I, I could tell it was an environment in which, um, it would match my pace, which was one of kind of fast learning um, and soaking up as many experiences as possible. And that's, of course, what New York gave to me. Um, so went to work um, at the NBC page program, which was kind of a that's a tough program to get into. I'm going to I'm going to stop you right there for a second. I know plenty of people who applied to that NBC page program. And like, you know, what it was, it's a difficult program to get accepted to for the congratulations early on for like reaching those milestones. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's really an interesting experience. You're in this room, you're up against your competition, other folks who want to become pages, and you have to give a two minute speech on why you would make the next best page in addition to other um, kind of, you know, rapid fire interview questions. And so that was so you learned pitching early on. Yes, absolutely. That was the first time I learned also and to quote one of my favorites, Taylor Swift, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, (laughs) If it's been said for eons, you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I am an anal planner. Oh, absolutely. And so it was two minutes, but I couldn't have prepared anymore. I knew my speech, like the back of my hand, I had prepared documents. I brought um, a, you know, a a piece of collateral with me, which I think went a little bit above and beyond. Um, and once I felt comfortable in that having down my pitch, then I could have more fun with it. And so I think that's something that's been a really big learning as well. It's not about memorizing the material. It's not about knowing the numbers. It's about really to your core understanding what you're saying. So even if you trip up a little bit here or there, the thread is there. And just to understand what are your top points, right? Especially in this day and age, there's like no attention span. What are you getting across that will stay with people? And and I think, you know, what you're sharing is like a little deviation of what we were going to talk about, but it's, it's very true. I mean, in the speaking I do all the time, 
I know I don't memorize my content. And I know my content, it's part, it's part of me. It's, it's that muscle memory, but it, it comes out the way it's supposed to come out at that time based on the energy of the audience, the conversations that's been had. And if I get caught up in, well, this is what's supposed to be said next, that's when I trip up as opposed to staying with the pace. And um, this is, I, I delivered something the other night and just based on the people, a panel discussion that went on before me, my content was my content, but it was squished up in a completely different type, type of delivery that ended up being incredibly powerful because you have to stay present. Absolutely. Um, we do, you know, jumping ahead to what I'm doing now, and um, we do a lot of events, and you can plan for an event to go a certain way. You can have panel questions. You can um, be prepared for a presentation, but you have to read the room because you want, especially in this day and age, that experience to be the best experience possible. So there are times when I've spent hours pouring into, you know, panel interviews and a plan for how an event will go. And then you just, you kind of feel that, you know, the audience might have a lot of questions. And so you say, Hey, just want to put this out there. Can we answer any questions for you, especially on our topics of reproductive care when there are so many questions going on right now. And so we've been able to pick up from that energy and really have a amazing in-person experience where it's not just about you getting your content out to the audience. You're really giving people what they need. Um, and I think that's something that I've learned throughout my career, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship in the workplace, um, it's not about you pushing out your agenda. You know, everyone, um, has their own priorities and you have to, um, listen, take in that information, hear what people are saying, and then be able to respond to that. Um, and so definitely a lifelong career lesson for sure. I'm going to ask you something because in the events you do, is there anything, um, you do in reading a room and getting a feel for the pulse of what's going on? Is there any methodology or tricks or, or tips that you have mastered over yeah. this time? Yeah. I mean, I think you said it best staying present so that you can pick up on those cues. Are people looking at their phones and looking bored? Are they laughing? Do their eyes light up or like whisper to a friend when something was said? I think having that interaction with, with the audience, um, and that's why I really like a more intimate group, um, and, or just cultivating an environment in which it's very clear people can react or they can raise hands or they can do, you know, whatever the format supports, um, to really understand what's resonating. So in, in building this, this career and becoming a VP of marketing and, and moving on up from here, I know one of the things we chatted about is the importance of working for companies that are mission driven okay. for you. So can you share a little bit about how that developed for you and how you followed through a bit? Because let's be real, everybody has um, thoughts like, oh, I would like to do this. And then you have a job here and you just take it because it's a job. And yep. there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. There, are, That is not a criticism because we must, you know, there, there's, um, there, there's, there's navigating a career, to, navigating as you scale your career. So how, have, how has the decisions aligned with your core values and goals? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're so right. You need to be practical and you can't just say, oh, I'm only going to work at a company that gives back X percent of profits or whatever it is. Let's be, let's be practical. So what I've done, and this is, you know, a learning in retrospect, looking back and kind of going back to my career, um, after the page program, I worked in financial news. I went from NBC to sister company CNBC um, during the time of the financial crisis. And I was learning so much and felt so filled up from that knowledge that I could then learn, regurgitate, um, perhaps um, translate into more clear um, communications to explain to the audience what was going on in the market. Um, so for me, and you know, you might say, look, 
you know, working at CNBC, that's not like altruistic. And I can't say that it was. Um, but for me, I really felt like I was doing something that was powerful. My words were getting out into the world at a time when people were stressed, they were looking at their bank accounts, they didn't know what was going on. And it just in conversations with my friends, I could tell that the knowledge that I had and could share with them was helpful. And so I thought about that really every day when I was working. Um, that said, you know, it, um, it was really tough in media as a, as a female and in a very ch fast changing landscape moving over to digital. Um, and so I decided at that point to kind of, um, develop my hard skill set further by getting my MBA, um, really focusing on some of those skills that I felt were not as developed while I was working in a more creative industry. So I wanted to focus on those, you know, financial um, analysis skills, um, you know, everything that it takes to build a strong business and, and learn about different functions and then figure out what I liked from there. Um, and kind of continuing in that theme of constant development and learning. Um, I think after that experience, I took too hard of a right turn and went into finance because I really wanted to prove to myself that I could do it, that I could, you know, quote unquote, play with the boys. I had that hard skill set. Um, and ultimately after about a year and a half, um, I, I missed more creative endeavors. I felt like I was not leaning into those things that actually I was best at that I naturally gravitated towards. And I was just fighting against my natural inclination to really want to pursue more creative pursuits because something was telling me, you know, that's not, that's not a worthy career. Um, so I would say, and I'll get back to your point, I promise. <laughs> um, and to your question, um, was that, you know, you can make a meaningful career out of things that you're passionate about, even if you think, you know, oh, they're not like the most respected in business or in whatever career you're in. Um, and I was really lucky that I kind of followed that inclination. Um, I combined the more creative background and communications-based background. I developed working in television with those kind of financial and um, operating skills um, that I developed at business school and at my, my finance roles and combined that into the world of digital marketing um, and found um, a startup book of the month that really wanted that um, unique background that combined those skills um, where I and, could. And startups are interesting places because startups are looking for people who are scrappy, right? Yeah. Who have a multiple, you know, skill sets that, that trend there, there's that, that word transferable skill sets, right? We, we use it often. What skill sets do you have that are transferable? In the startup world, you're looking for people who could do a little bit of, right? Pitching in here and here and here that helps that company really start escalating in the early years. Absolutely. Um, and I think also, you know, going back to that, okay, mission driven and, and what does that mean to you? For me, I found the power of books. I think at a time when, you know, social media was just, inundating. It was like the rise of Instagram. Um, I really, you know, and at various points in my life, breakups have just always turned back to books um, and felt so strongly and passionately about getting, um, you know, contemporary books into the hands of young women like myself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of that passion, that mission that was important to me, coupled with this really entrepreneurial startup environment where it was encouraged to just take on more um, and to build. And that environment has really been a strong fit um, with, you know, me and I think with folks like me who just want to um, learn about everything and take on more. And so I definitely encourage people to pursue those opportunities, even if it's a little bit scary, even yeah. if you know, they might be at a really early stage, or maybe you're taking what looks like a step back in your career. Um, I've always kind of bet in myself and the ability to, to build brands. Um, and of course, it's not just me, you have to look at certain foundations at a company. Um, and for me, I think it's really about being super passionate about what that company's mission is. Um, 
I will say, so, so that was definitely something that drove me at book of the month and finding like-minded people who just were so passionate about the written word. Um, and so how did that move into WISP? Yeah. How, how does one move into another? Once you're at one mission driven company, how did, how did that become that catalyst? Yeah. And well, I think it's really interesting too, to identify, you know, a, a, um, a role like marketing, you really can um, use those skills in different functions. Not everyone does. Some people stay in CPGs or in beauty and fashion. And for me, because I'm so curious um, and I could say maybe got bored a little bit easily, I really want to learn about as many industries as possible that are important to me. Um, I, after book of the month, wanted to take on kind of a larger challenge and was presented with an opportunity with a legacy brand, Aerosol's Shoes. Um, as of course. Well. Yes. <laughs> so you might remember them from malls in the 90s. Um, of course. They are a comfort shoe that was actually founded to support the working woman who would go into the office or on her commute in sneakers and then have to change out into her heels um, before going into the office in the 80s and 90s. And the founder said, that's not right. We need to make a comfortable shoe to support, you know, this generation of hardworking women who also want to look and feel good. Um, so that was something that I definitely could stand behind. And the company was going through a really um, transitional point. So it had a large retail presence. And obviously we all know brick and mortar stores. Yeah really challenged. No one goes to the malls anymore. Everyone shops online. And so they were looking, they had new owners who were looking to transition them to a direct to consumer e-commerce business. Um, and I was kind of tasked with keeping that core customer who is used to finding aerosols in stores while acquiring this new younger customer online. Um, and so, you know, this is not something that I had experience with before working in retail, but I think, you know, just being really, really curious about what's important. And in the retail business, there's much more of a, uh, an inventory management merchandising is a, is a key piece there. And mm -hmm. so working hand in hand with folks at the company who were experts in those areas, um, where I could tell them what I knew about marketing and how to acquire customers and how do we reach our old customers while learning about um, merchandising and how to, you know, lead with um, certain product um, and how to do inventory planning to manage a healthy business. Um, and so I've always been a fan as well of just kind of um, if I'm not confident about something or, you know, trying to learn a new thing, really testing and being clear about what I'm testing, um, seeing the results and then leaning into what's working and calling a test that's, that's not working um, and communicating the whole way in your approach. Um, and so that was quite successful. And I think going back to, okay, um, being mission driven, I wanted to make sure that as the company rebranded, we had corporate social responsibility at the forefront. Um, and this was tough, right? Because we had not a lot of resources. We were bought by a private equity firm, wanted to show, you know, cash flow. Um, so I kind of figured out, okay, what can we do? And found a, an amazing organization called 1% for the Planet, um, which was started by um, one of the founders of, of um, what, Patagonia. That's what of I'm course. Thinking. Okay. Like it's a keyword. It's a Friday. Um, exactly. <laughs> they have a strong give back component. Um, and so basically we just had to commit to 1% of profits going to um, these environmental causes. And so that was, oh, you know, just a small way that we could get the company really oriented around that and starting to think more about sustainability. Um, which, you know, was important in retail. We know fashion is a large contributor to the climate crisis. Um, and so, so okay, go, let, let, let's finish this. Go ahead. 
Yeah, no. Um, and then I think just during the pandemic was looking for something that was even more impactful and obviously saw how healthcare was incredibly important and there was reduced access throughout the country. Um, and so fortunately found WISP. Um, it was really small at the time, about 15 people. And um, their whole mission is increasing access to sexual and reproductive health care, particularly for people with vaginas. Um, and, you know, smaller company, a little bit riskier, but just believed so strongly in what they were doing um, that I was super excited for the challenge. And it's been two years. We've seen amazing growth. I've gotten to um, hire an amazing team and nice. and yeah, a, a great, a great ride. So um, in the work WISP is doing before, Ed, because I want to make sure we touch on this, um, is it, what have you found different or interesting in approaching this type of market and what have you learned from that? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to healthcare and especially these issues, it's highly stigmatized. Um, that's that's why we're here, right? Um, for example, we talk about um, herpes, which impacts 70% of the population, um, but no one talks about it. It's heavily, you know, there's a lot of shame associated yeah. with it. Um, and so I think that's interesting. Um, it's about finding those communities um, that do want to talk about it on social, you know, those certain influencers and content creators um, doing a lot of educational content that people can come to. And, you know, we don't have to, um, you don't necessarily, if you're embarrassed, have to like, um, you know, it, it, it's whatever we meet our patients where they are. So whether they're reading a blog article, they've got an email or they're following us on social, um, or if they want to partner with us in a larger way, we're going to meet them where they are. Um, and I think leaning into education has been incredibly important, especially at this time when there's so much misinformation out there about women's health. So what is the one thing that has surprised you in this journey for yourself? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, you are constantly learning and developing. I think you have to prove yourself over and over again. I don't think I've ever, you know, rested on my laurels or being comfortable in a job. And I think that's what's made me successful. Um, and that's that's hard and can be exhausting. Yeah. So definitely take the time um, to do that self-care. Um, and I think, you know, going back to preparation and planning, um, you really can't underestimate that. And I also think as women, we have to take as much time explaining what we do, um, especially as we get further along in our careers, recapping our results um, versus just the doing and the work, um, because often we don't get credit for that work if we don't ourselves really work to communicate all that we've done. I think that is that is so true um, in taking the ownership to be our own advocates and owning our accomplishment. I have said to many, many people, and this is one tip I'll leave everybody with, keep a success journal and they don't have to be big milestones. Little things, speaking up at a meeting, um, standing for something that was uncomfortable, um, even doing a good habit, you know, we, you and I started chatting about, oh, it's, you know, we're recording this on a Friday and it's like, oh, you worked out this morning. It's like, oh, I garden this morning, right? What keep those, that journal going of all that you do that you're happy about yourself with and use that to continuously build your confidence. That's just something that I have found to be incredibly helpful. Absolutely agree. So thank Jenny, thank you so much for joining me here today at Her Success Story. Thank you. And listeners, I'm going to leave you with the ending that is one of my favorites. If you found today's interesting, you continue to listen. Take a moment and say, what did I take away from here? What was most helpful for you, your career, your life? What piece, what component? Write it down and create an action for yourself that will help you continue to move forward. Continue to stay for great, many, many more wonderful interviews and content episodes here at Heart Success Story. We will see you next time.